this is a, a, a picture from William Blake's illustration of, of the Bible, and this is his illustration of the book of Ruth. And the, the book of, of Ruth uh, focuses on a, a great figure, uh, a Moabite woman who is the, uh, in the line of, of David, David's great-great-great-grandmother, something like, like that, I should know, but I've, I've forgotten. Uh, and what you, you see here, uh, the, the woman who is, is holding her hands out in, in appeal uh, is a woman named Naomi who's in a very difficult circumstance. And Naomi went into a, a foreign land with her husband and two sons, uh, and her husband died, and her two sons died. And it left her alone, except for her, her two daughter-in-laws. And uh, one of the, the daughter-in-laws, uh, Orpah, is on the right, and she is, is walking away in, in sadness from Naomi. And the other daughter-in-law, Ruth, who's the, the, the center part of, of the story, uh, she is, is holding to Naomi. She is holding to the, the duties that she undertook. So she became a, a part of, of this woman's family. Uh, she entered into a, a relationship through her husband, with, with Naomi, and she has a very grim choice at this point. Uh, Naomi now uh, was once able to provide her with a husband, uh, a, a grandfather figure. Uh, they were an economic unit. They were sustaining themselves, but now their whole world has collapsed into death, and they're facing starvation. They're facing mistreatment, and uh, Naomi has decided to, to go back home to Israel. And so there is a, a choice that, that Ruth had and that Orpah had uh, to remain faithful to their relationship or to break it. And Orpah decides to break it very reasonably. And Naomi explains why it's so reasonable. She can, she can no longer help these women. She can, she can no longer uh, assist them in life. She can't promise them food. She can't promise them shelter. She can't promise them uh, any of the needs of their life. Uh, and she says, there's, there's no hope for that in me. So abandon me. Abandon me. And Orpah uh, decides to do that. And you see her walking away in, in grief. Uh, but Ruth, by contrast... Uh, clings to Naomi, and uh, she is so blessed because of them. She, is, she goes through so many difficulties, so many uncertainties. She goes into a, a, a foreign land. Uh, in that foreign land, it's uncertain what will, will happen to her, uh, and it's because of the great virtue, it turns out, of their kinsman redeemer, Boaz, uh, that, that things work out okay for her, but she doesn't know any of that at this point. And this has been used as a, a great symbol throughout the, the church's history of faithfulness, of, of constancy. Ruth's hallmark virtue is that at one point in time, she made a choice to become a part of this family. And then the circumstances completely changed, but she remained true. She remained true. She remained faithful. She, she, in her life, exemplified this virtue of being constant, being one thing. Because you can be many things. You, you can uh, today say, I will uh, to do this good thing with you. And then tomorrow you can change your mind. You, you can do that. That's, that's one aspect of freedom. One aspect of, of freedom that we have is variability. But variability, the ability to change your mind, can be interpreted in two ways. One, it can be the essence of freedom. That today I can tell you I will be your friend, and tomorrow I can betray you. Today I can say I will do this, and then tomorrow I can change my mind, and that's the essence of freedom. Or it can be interpreted as a corruption of freedom. That the, the essence of, of freedom is the capacity for faithfulness. It, it is the, the capacity in us that allows ourselves to continue over time to be true 
and constant. You, you can understand something in terms of its worst form or in terms of its best form. To understand freedom in terms of the ability to change. I, I'm married today, but tomorrow I don't want to be married. I've made a vow today to be faithful to a person, but tomorrow I don't want to do that. That's our modern ideal of freedom. That freedom is realized in marriage, for example, if we allow people today to get married and then tomorrow to get divorced. If we allow people today to commit to one thing and then tomorrow to do whatever they please. That that's what liberation is. But the, the ideal that we see in the book of Ruth is very different. That the ideal of freedom is somebody who makes a decision and stays true to it. So you can think of your, your personality as something that has an infinite number of manifestations. I'm Eric 1 today, I'm Eric 2 tomorrow, I'm Eric 3, I'm Eric 4, I'm Eric 5. Every instant, a new manifestation of me occurs, and each instant of Eric should be able to make up his own mind about what to do. And nothing that I've done in the past should bind me. I shouldn't stay true to my commitments except insofar as it manifests my present desire. I shouldn't repent of anything I've done in the past because I'm not responsible for what was done in the past. There are many, 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 many instantiations of me. But the, the contrary view, and the only one that doesn't lead to madness, is that I am one, and my will is one. And the ability to will one thing and hold to it is what we mean by being truthful. It's what we mean by being faithful. Uh, and we'll see later, that's exactly what God shows us real freedom is like. We are, we are made for eternity, not for the instant. We are e eternal beings, not in instant beings. We, we will go on forever. And our, our will struggles to push itself into that eternal aspect and to be true, just like God's will is true. So we, we talked previously about the Proverbs 31 woman and how her personality is manifested. I can see again. Thank you very much. Uh, how her personality is manifested in her th property, in the way she manifests it in the arrangement of her life in physical things. This woman, Ruth, had no property. She was completely impoverished. She had, she had no goods, like the Proverbs 31 woman, on which to express and manifest her personality. But she was far from unable to show the beautiful person that she is. She was far from unable, despite that, to manifest her personality. She did it through faithfulness to the agreement that she makes with Naomi. To be true to her, to accompany her, to follow her through life. And that's our subject for today, contract. Contract is a, an aspect of human freedom. Contract is an aspect of human freedom that celebrates freedom in its proper sense, freedom in faithfulness. Freedom not of the instant in my relationship to objects, as with, with property, but freedom across time. My ability now to undertake action that affects me not just in this instant, but that affects me throughout my life. That's the aspect of faithfulness. And Stahl says, it seems to me quite, quite reasonably, that if we want to understand private law, if we want to understand how it's a manifestation of human personality, the, the possibilities, how it's an indication of the great divine image in which we're made, we, we have to understand uh, it not only in terms of our instant relationship to things through, through property, but also in my eternal relation, the fact that I am one personality throughout all of time. And that's what sounds in contract, as we'll, we'll hopefully see. So again, just to, to remind, remember how we, we get here, right? Stahl says, what is uh, private law about? This matters to you because most of you will spend your, your careers dealing with the institutions of private law, property, contract, something else. What else is a good private law example? Torts. Torts is a good private law example 
as well. Corporate law, family law, uh, all these sorts of things are what you'll spend the bulk of your time doing and thinking about. What's it all about? What, is, what are these things doing? Uh, and on the one hand, many of your clients will be interested in the, the concerns of this world. And, 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 pro and property law and tort law, they are uh, arrayed in this way. But they're more than that. They are ways that we are reminded and, and shown the nature of human personality. So we, we see Stahl saying yes. Uh, private law is obviously concerned with our material needs, our, our desires, what we have to have. But private law is the mechanism by which we assure people have those things while at the same time always recognizing that they are bearers of the divine image, that they are free personalities. So remember these definitions. Private law, Stahl argued, is rightly understood. It's rightly structured. This would be how we arrange it. By connecting things needed by man. Man needs things. But only in terms of his freedom. Only in terms of his potential for faithfulness. That is to say, his ability to act now, but to act for all the instance of his, of his life, to bind himself now with respect to all the aspects of his life, not merely this instant. It, it is the, the set of institutions we use so that material ends don't become an end in themselves, but they become connected, bound up with the expression of the real potentials of our human personality. I gave you this example before. We, we could provide everybody with their material needs. We could use the, the tools of government power. We could use the tools of economics and sociology uh, to treat people like animals and simply make sure that they all get their assigned amount of food. We could put up barriers, whether actual cages or threats of the use of criminal force against them, uh, to, to make people not injure each other. These chickens, if they're allowed just to to go against each other, we'll peck each other's eyes out and do terrible things. And so we separate them. We put them in little boxes. A horrible thing, perhaps, to do. But anyway, that's their goal in this. We could do the same thing with people. Treat them like animals for the purposes of keeping them alive and healthy and satisfied with all their material needs. But if we were to treat people like this, perhaps even if we treat chickens like this, we see a problem, which is there, there's something about the nature even of a chicken that can't be expressed in this way. There is something about the nature of a chicken, not the, not the brightest of birds, that can't be expressed by keeping them in little, little boxes. How much more so a law, a legal system, which tried to keep man well-fed, well-clothed, safe, but with no fundamental recognition of their full potentials of human personality? Another way of, of putting this, Stahl says, man is, is lifted out of the material base of his existence and into the essence of the spirit. He is, is made of, of dust, but the divine breath has been breathed into him. It's, it's easy for us. I, I feel hunger so acutely. I feel cold so sharply. I feel fear of damage to my body so deeply. It's easy for me to keep at the forefront of my mind only these things and to begin to treat myself solely as an object that should be measured according to whether my material needs are met. Material needs are, are relevant, Stahl says. But you aren't just material. If your material needs are, are satisfied in this way, you are deeply wounded because you are, are not simply dust. You are not simply a, a, a center point of material needs. You have a spiritual identity. You have divine breath. You have personality. You have freedom that flows into faithfulness. You have the uh, vocation that God has given you that you can express and show your divine calling in the way that you relate to physical things in this world. 
Man finds himself dependent upon the material. For this reason, because he's made of dust, man is on the one hand dependent on the material world. He needs it. We're not going to get away from that. We need it. We, we need external relations that enable us to satisfy our, our desires and our physical dependence on material things. We have a kind of lordship over creation. We're capable of arranging ourselves in this way. And so all societies have systems for allocating, distributing, managing material goods. But that can't be our only, one, our only concern. In the manner of achieving our satisfaction, in the arrangement of our lifestyle and our, our conduct, the personality of man must actively involve itself. This is the, the great objection to all kinds of socialism, all kinds of, of communism, all kinds of attempts to, to manage man. Not according to his, his spiritual capability for, for personality, but simply with reference to his physical condition. Man has the ability to interact with the world. But man has the ability to do that to the exclusion of his spiritual nature. And when he does so, he isn't advanced. He is crippled. So remember, when Stahl talks about the word property, uh, he's talking about it in a, a broader sense than, than we do today. He's talking about it in the sense of, of legal rights over things. And he says property includes, in the sense that he's been talking about it all along, physical uh, control over things, rights over things, but also rights concerning people's actions. And that's where we get to contract. And he draws a parallel between the two of them. I, can, I, can, I need things in the world. I need uh, to have land. I need to have paintbrushes if I'm an artist. I need to have books if I'm a lawyer. Or I need to have a computer where I can look up cases if I'm, I'm a lawyer, we might say, say today. But just as much as I desperately depend on physical objects for my material uh, needs, I also depend on people's services, on people's actions. This is the, the whole basis, of course, of our modern economy. Our, our whole modern economy is based on the, the specialization of the professions, the specialization of activities. Every man doesn't make his own food, make his own clothing, make his own shelter. We specialize. And because of that, we prosper. Every man is not his own lawyer. He, hopefully he hires you to be his lawyer. And you have spent all your, your time training to be a lawyer, and so you can do a faster, better, more efficient job than if he tried to be his own lawyer. But you are no good at milking goats. You are, are no good at, at planting rice. So if you waited for your, your goat milk and you waited for your rice on your own labor, you would go very hungry indeed. We, we rely, and we see that to a great extent today, we rely on other people's services for our needs just as much as we do physical goods. And this is the aspect of property that we're concerned with today. So again, to summarize, private law is a kind of mirror for us. This is the, the sense we were talking about with the Proverbs 31 woman. We talked about it in the case of all the ways in which this, this, uh, this good woman, her personality, <coughs> is displayed in material arrangements. And you might think as, as a Christian, we don't think that, that who we are as a person is displayed in, in our goods, but Proverbs 31 shows the lie of that. Absolutely it's showed in the way we use our goods. Using your goods for liberality, to give to the poor, to support your family. Using your goods efficiently, creating wealth for your community. All of those are ways of showing the divine love that is within you. Our, our, our belief that we're made in the image of God is not a belief that we should go in a dark corner and sit and withdraw into ourselves, that we should live in an egg. Rather, it's something that the Bible teaches us is displayed in the arrangement of the world. It is, it is displayed in our interaction with physical, physical things. So in an 
important sense, though, Stahl says, remember, though, private law is just a, a shadow. It's, a, it's an image. It's a type of greater spiritual realities. It's, it's those spiritual realities in relationship to satisfying our material needs. But, but of course, our life is not just about our material needs. Uh, our, our life is, we can die, we can starve to death and still feel, fully realize our purpose in Jesus Christ. We can be killed and still fully realize our obedience to God. A private law does not express the, the fullness of all of these things, but it derives from them. We, we take the, the great idea of freedom that we learn in the scriptures. We take the, the great idea of personality, that we are made in the divine image, that we are like our brother Jesus Christ, that we are, we are uh, capable of realizing aspects of what is spiritual and divine. And in private law, we're just teaching people a very thin aspect of that. We're teaching them the, the aspect that pertains to uh, the satisfaction of material needs. But still, the idea of freedom, the idea of personality that we're teaching in that regard is drawn from the greater vision. Uh, we want freedom. We, we want it at the deepest level. We, we want to, uh, to show that in our, our laws. But the idea of freedom that we have needs to be drawn from the full revelation of freedom, the full understanding of, of freedom that we have. We were just talking about this verse on, on Tuesday, John 8, 31. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my, my disciples. I'm, I'm your master, and you are my disciples. I am the model, and you are the, the ones who are modeling yourself after me. I am the, the master, and you are the servants who are following my instruction. That language is language of, of limitation, of constraint. If you hold to my teaching, if you follow what I have said, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. The notion of, of freedom that, that we want to, to realize in the private law, when we say we want everyone to have their material necessities, but we want it, them only to take what they need in a way that reflects their real personality. You, through Jesus Christ, know something about real personality. The, the world today is saying that the way that you have real personality, real freedom, is complete liberation from any dependence upon anyone else's mind, anyone else's orders, anyone else's structure, that any structure which is outside of yourself is a limitation on your freedom. You should be yourself. You should follow your own mind. You should reject any kind of uh, authority, any kind of social constraint that wrongfully inhibits what you are in yourself. And, and Jesus says something very different. The, the way to freedom comes through truth, and the way to truth comes through being his disciple, following him. Freedom does not come by wavering. Truth does not come by wavering. Truth comes by following God. Outside of that, if you follow the way of the world today, if you listen to its, its teachings, there is nothing but enslavement. The scripture declares, outside of Christ, the whole world is a prisoner of sin. But before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law. And so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. And now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. The, the teachings of the law, the, the teachings that we've been given uh, through the private law, through the Mosaic law, which includes laws of contract, laws of, of property, are not complete in themselves. They, they, are, they are not true, absolute freedom in themselves. They are meant to lead us to a true and absolute freedom. 
And we don't get there by embracing this modern sense of, of the world, that there is, is nothing except myself. We get there by following the teachings of the law back towards the truth and the freedom that we really desire. Okay, so that's our, our, our background. Stahl says, private law is, is about showing us true freedom, true personality. Uh, how does contract help us do that? A contract might seem like an exception to this because contract doesn't seem to be about freedom. It seems to be about binding people. I make a contract and I do it with the aim to bind myself. So how can that help my personality evolve, change, symbolize, show forth in the world real freedom? Here's the problem. I have the experience that today I will one thing and tomorrow I will another thing. And so if I identify my freedom with that, if I identify my personality with waverability, if I identify my personality with the, the desire I find in my heart, sometimes to choose evil, sometimes to choose good, if I call that freedom, well then, uh, wouldn't maximizing freedom mean not binding people to their promises, but freeing them? Uh, today, I will to deliver a certain amount of wheat to you in one year's time for a certain amount of money. And today, another man wills to pay me that certain amount of money for the wheat. But if they change their minds in a year, why would freedom, why would the realization of the potentials of human personality, why would that call us to legally intervene on that? Why not respect their freedom? Why not say, well, you've changed your mind. We are a liberated society we should allow you to, to do that. Why not do that? And the, the answer is, we don't think that's what freedom is. We don't think that you're more free if you can never be held responsible for the decisions you make. You are less free. Because while you are free to change your mind in the former case, you are never free to set out on a course for your entire life. I mean, imagine if people had never heard of marriage before. They had no concept of marriage, for example. And they were incapable of thinking about marriage. They were, they were incapable of thinking about binding themselves to one person in sexual faithfulness, uh, in companionship, in the rearing of children for their life. They just couldn't think of it. It wasn't, it wasn't a door that was open to them. The, the only door that was open to them with respect to human sexuality was to indulge human passions, momentary passions, for uh, sex. That's it. Would they be more free or less free? It seems obvious to me the answer is they would be less free. There, there's a dimension of life, choosing to be with a person sexually for their entire life, that they wouldn't be capable of. And that's what's at issue with respect to contract. If I cannot have a sense of myself as being able to set out on a course across time, to bind myself not just for the instant, but across time, and ultimately this means across all time, what the law is preparing us for, what the law is leading us to, is a, an understanding of ourselves as eternal beings that can make a, a willed choice for God forever. If I don't have any of that, well, then I'm not more free. I, I am enslaved to the instant. I am enslaved to the moment. I, I also have, when I look at myself in that way, I look down on myself. That would be a, a material kind of animal way. Animals, they, they have to make decisions in the instant. They follow their instinct. Every instant they make a new instinctual decision. But precisely part of what we mean by, by reason not in its modern sense of acting like a computer, but, but reason in its great sense is participation in the eternal logos, in the eternal word. It's, it's having a sense 
of our transcendence of time. That's why reason contemplates what is eternal, what is true forever. Not because it wants to be deductive, not because it wants to be computer-like, but because reason is our share of eternity. It's our concern with eternity. It's our, our view of ourselves and of the world under the eye of eternity. And so I can't be reasonable. I can't be rational. I cannot share in the eternal word, in the eternal logos, unless I can see myself across time. If we say of everyone, you can't contract, you just make a decision now and then you make another decision later, we're not going to bind your, your freedom. We do not set people free. We lock them in the cage of the moment. We lock them in an infinite number of tiny cages where they are incapable of binding themselves and passing through uh, the moments of their life. And they learn a bad lesson. Because the, the image in which we were made is not a wavering image. The divine image in which we were made is constant. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Here we have these sins that people do. I say, I'll help you, and then I don't show up. I say, I, I promise you that I will remain true to you and then I don't. This is the, the sin of man. The, the, the sin of man is that in our sinfulness, in our, our fall from the image in which we're made, we treat ourselves as if we are free from what we've done in the past, as if we are, are like animals who should make up their mind in each instant what to do. That's okay for animals. It's not okay for you. Because God is not like that. God is one through eternity. He is, he is constant and true in his course. God says, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. What I have said, I will bring about. What I have planned, I will do. Now, there's a lot to be, to be said here, of course, if we make a mistake, if we, we discover that we've willed something against what we, we should have done, we're not bound in conscience when we disobey God's law. You can change your mind in various good ways. You can repent of, of follies you've committed in the past. There's much to say about this. But I, I, I want to focus in on just one point. The model, the ideal for us, is not constantly to be remaking ourselves in our own will. It is, it is not like a, a, a wave to be rising and falling. It's not like a candle to be flickering back and forth. It is to be a constant and steady light. It is to be one across time. Where does that ideal come from? It comes from God. It comes from God's steady purpose of love for all of us. I, the Lord, do not change. Is that good or bad for us? It's good for us. Because God doesn't change, we are not destroyed. We turn away from God's covenant. We turn away from the eternal way that God has, has shown us. We defile it. We desecrate it. But God's love for us remains steady. He's still moving in the path of the covenant he made. And you, because of his steadiness, can turn back to him. It's because of his steadiness and the steadiness of, of his love that our, our repentance and our restoration is, is possible. Even God chooses to symbolize the steadiness of his purpose to us through the form of contracts. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear. His purpose was always very clear. His nature was always unchanging. But, but contract symbolizes some. It's a portion of the law that we were talking about before that is a pedagogue to us, teaching us the, the, the path, teaching us, pointing out for us the eternal character of Christ, 
Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Moses was always crying out in these ways. Know that God is God. Know that he is faithful. Know that he is always keeping his covenant of love. That's the divine image in which you're made. You you can reduce yourself to dust. You can reduce yourself to animality by saying, I am not called to that kind of constancy. But when, when God wants to remind us of his constancy, to call us back to his image, what does he do with us? He makes covenants. He makes contracts. He takes oaths. He uses the forms by which the the law has taught us not to allow ourselves to be in the moment, but to extend our obligations over time. According to Stahl, therefore, contract can't be explained in terms of, of freedom alone if we're just talking about our ability to choose a course in, in e- each instant. So he says, should one, as most of the natural law teachers do, derive the obligatory nature of contract simply from the power of choice, simply from freedom? Well, that would explain why I can give something away. In the instant, I can bind myself. I can give something to you. Perhaps that's enough. To be free in the instant, I have to be able to take real effective action in the instant. But it it doesn't explain future commitment. And this is a really important thing for you to, to think about in our, our, our culture today, which has so many contradictions, which is so incoherent. One of the great ones is we, we celebrate people's absolute self-determination instant to instant to instant. But we are also, because material society would fall apart without it, we also find ourselves stuck saying, well, your ancestors signed a constitution. Your ancestors voted for a constitution, and you are in in lineal succession from those people, so their decision binds you. This is the the great calamity of of liberal societies today, is they, they can't explain in any way why actions in the past should bind anyone today. Not individuals, because we celebrate absolute freedom. Today I'm a man, tomorrow I want to be a woman, then I want to be a man again. Today I'm Caucasian, tomorrow I'm African American, today I'm Caucasian again. In the United States, this is treated as the essence of liberty. The the absolute right to make determinations variable over time. Well then, if I've made a contract yesterday, why should I be bound today? If I was a man yesterday, I can be a woman today. But I'm bound by some piece of paper I signed in the past? I can can discover an entirely new identity for myself day to day to day under the the current thinking in the United States. There is absolute individual freedom. My my freedom is is so broad that I can have the right to fundamentally change my identity. But then why on earth would I be bound by the contract I made yesterday? Why would I be bound by the actions of my ancestors in making a constitution? How is any of this intelligible? And Stahl says it's not intelligible. If you celebrate the will as the essence of freedom and the will alone, not the will and faithfulness, not the the ability to transcend time, not the ability to remain constant over time, but if you simply celebrate freedom of choice as freedom of choice, none of the institutions that we rely on in the most basic aspects of social solidarity and stability are intelligible at all. Who cares that my parents or my grandparents or my great-great-grandparents or my great-great-great-grandparents voted for the U.S. Constitution? Who cares? What does that have to do with me? You can't even explain why I should remain true to a commitment that I personally made because your notion of freedom is not a value that is being constant over time, that is being divine-like, that is sustaining over time. Your image is some, uh, I won't even say what their image is. Their image is not Ruth. Their their image is, is, is not of a, their image of free will is not of a person 
who marries into a family and maintains her constant will of faithfulness to that family despite every misfortune, despite death, despite relocation into a radically different culture. That is the divine way of freedom. The divine way of freedom is constancy. Even though we disobey the covenant, even though we are unloving, God is loving. The divine way of freedom is Ruth's way of freedom. Even though my personal preferences change, I hold tight to Naomi. Is that the, the, the essence of, of human will? Is that the capability that human will really refers to? Or is it the ability to vary? Freedom lies in the essence of the person. And this does provide the possibility of surrender. I can surrender something in the instant. I can relinquish something. I can accept something. I can be aggrandized. But immutability, constancy, lies also in that essence. Accordance with which a relinquishment now willed is also willed with all its consequences, taking them into account with the same certainty as something that is already present. What Saul is saying here is, it is a false view of the human being that when we will something in the instant, we cannot will something for all of our lives. That I cannot will, that I cannot bind myself in this means that my freedom does not mean that I, as a personality stretching out over my whole life, over all eternity, cannot bind myself. Even bind my heirs, even bind my children. This immutability, this constancy, this, this idea of freedom, not as the ability to change, but as the ability to be faithful and to persevere, that's where contracts, that's where constitutions, that's where partnerships, that's where they achieve their sense. We need an institution that reflects another aspect of human personality. Physical property I can express in the instant, but I need another institution an institution that works even if I have no property, that enables me to express my capability for binding myself permanently across time. If you can't do this, you're not free. You're not liberated. You are restrained. You are trapped in the present. Contract is, is, cannot be explained in terms of freedom of choice. It has to be explained in terms of freedom and faithfulness. But the entire binding character of it is based on this incredible capacity we have for faithfulness. I, I am not just uh, something trapped in the instant. Don't you see, I, I'm made in the image of God. I'm made to be constant and unchanging over time. Hold me accountable for that. This is very practical, too. A poor person goes to a, a rich person and says, please, um, I have, I have a, a job that's starting next week. I'm going to have, I'm gonna have good money. I can pay you back. Please, give me a loan so I can buy children for my food. Uh, for ch uh, for children for my food. No, 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 no. That's very bad. I can buy food for my children. i tell you, one mistake in order changes everything. I can buy food for my children. Come on, give me, give me a little liberty here. <laughs> Work with me a little bit. And the, the, the rich man says, well, I, you know, I don't know. Tomorrow, uh, when, you, when you get your paycheck, you may decide to go spend it on, on something else. Something else will seem more pleasurable to you than paying me back, surely. Surely, when, when you get your, your paycheck, it will be, you, you'll want to buy uh, nice clothes for yourself or your, or your wife or your, your children. You'll want to do something else. Uh, I, I, I believe you're the kind of thing, like my cow or my chicken, that just takes whatever is in that instant best for it. And the, the poor man wants to return and say, you have completely misunderstood what I am. I am, I am made in the image of God. I, I am, am not something that merely chooses in the instant. I can bind myself across time. You are, you are treating me like an animal. Treat me like a, a human being. 
If I say I bind myself now, I will be bound in the future. I am one thing across time. If we take that away from people, we aren't liberating them. We're enslaving them. The, the ideal of, of personality is the ideal of a unified entity of action and responsibility over time. That's how God presents himself to us. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The beginning, at the very beginning, now and forever. Forevermore, the same. You, you obviously aren't fully the same as, as God then, in that your will is weak, your will is sinful, it does waver. But you have the capability to respond to that. You are, are made in God's image. You are not made for the instant. You're made across time. And it is a, a, a wonderful thing that, that even someone without any material possession like Ruth, who has, unlike the Proverbs 31 wife, she doesn't have, have clothes to express it. She doesn't have food to express her charity in. She can't give Naomi food. She can't give Naomi clothing. She can't give Naomi aid and assistance of the physical kind. But even then, because she's made in God's image, she can give Naomi a great assistance. She can say, I bind myself to you. I promise I will follow you. I will remain true to you. I will give you myself in every way that I can. This is the inexhaustible wellspring of self-expression which is within you. To, to make decisions not just for the instant, but across time. Property you can lose. But, but the firmness and constancy of your will, that can't be taken away. Contract is, therefore, Stahl says, the means by which free being through their wills and this certain immutability, this faithfulness, establish bonds among themselves. So we, we live in societies with a completely corrupt notion of freedom, where freedom just means absence of restraint. We, we have this very corrupt notion that if you just uh, allow people to do whatever they want, that somehow they are more free. That if you, if you treat people without responsibility for their own commitments, for the actions of, their, of the past, if the more that you liberate the, instant, the individual from the consequences of the past, the more free he is. But of course, uh, even today, we show that we don't really believe that. If you, if you walk into a, a court and you're accused of some crime and you say, well, I didn't vote for that. I never consented to those laws. Or I consented yesterday, but I've changed my mind. Or I never consented to that Constitution. I never voted. I was never part of the Constitutional Assembly. I didn't elect representatives. I'm not bound by your politics because you say all politics are based on consent. I consented to nothing. And even if I did consent, I withdraw my consent today. They will laugh at you. Because the pragmatic consequences of, of not allowing people to project themselves into the future and, and hold themselves responsible are too obvious and too great. God has, has forced this upon us, in a sense. We, we all know that we have responsibility across time. We lie about it today. We've created incoherence in our legal systems today. We, we sometimes tell ourselves, as in the case of marriage, oh, there's nothing wrong with allowing people to walk out of marriage without fault. That's liberating. That's, that's freeing. We, we lie about it. We, we say, oh, lack of restraint, that's all freedom is. That's not all freedom is. Freedom e exists not simply in a society that says, don't do what you want to do. Society exists in, in a place where I and you, between us, as in groups, where we can bind ourselves, where we can get recognition of our acts of the will, not only in the moment, but across time. So what's at stake in contract law? What's at stake in contract law? In all of private law, what's at stake is expressing human personality. What's at stake in, in contract law? Stahl says, what's at stake in contract law is a true conception of human freedom. Not simply as the ability to change our mind, but to remain constant over time. Is that critical? 
Absolutely. Because our, uh, our understanding of who we are derived from God is not as things that flicker and fade and change and move, but as things which are aspiring to the eternal unity of love. Is contract about eternal unity of love? Stahl says no. Private law is related to material satisfaction of interest, but only in a way that pushes us, that recognizes and pushes us and is consistent with our fundamental character. Contract law is an essential part of recognizing not only what you are instant by instant by instant, but that you are something unified across time. Does it, does it teach that we are made for eternal unity of love with God? It suggests it like a pedagogue, like a teacher pointing, pointing something out. It's like one of my lectures. It's not quite clear, but I'm trying to point you in the right way. Why are you laughing at that? You shouldn't laugh. Yeah, yeah, of course, that's exactly what we all experience. We, we, we're being pointed to it. And the modern attacks on, on contract law that try to replace a, a, an idea of human freedom with simple notions of, of efficiency and, and economics, which encourage efficient breach if it's economically productive, with no reference to the idea of human faithfulness, they're all forms of attack on that. Private law is about expressing what you are, that you're made in the divine image, not just an animal. Contract law covers a particular part of that, pointing out your capacity for faithfulness to bind yourself across time. Let's pray together. Our Lord in heaven, you are unchanging in your purposes and in your will, and your purpose, Lord, is love. And you showed that to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who undertook to come and to save us. And his will didn't waver when he was rejected, when he was despised. His will didn't waver when he was betrayed. His will didn't waver when he was crucified. His will does not waver today. Our Father in heaven, in our, our limited way, help us to be like Ruth. Help us to be faithful. Father in heaven, in our work as lawyers, help us to protect the, the institutions which point to your faithfulness and point to our capacity for faithfulness, like contract law. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.